Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, welcome to our Manchester Academic Health Science Seminar uh, on inequalities. So my name is my name is Nikki Cullum, and I am director of the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration for Greater Manchester, or the ARC for short. Now, I'm particularly pleased to be chairing this seminar, which showcases some of our the wonderful research that's being done under the banner of the ARC. I'll introduce the speakers in a moment. Uh, and I'll introduce them both at the beginning and we'll pass seamlessly from one to the other at mid-seminar and take all questions and discussion at the end. And we're planning to reserve about 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Please feel free to pop questions in the chat at any stage as they occur to you, or by all means save them up and raise an electronic hand at the end. Or um, if neither of those methods appeal to you, you can email mask at healthinnovationmanchester.com and you'll see that email address there at the bottom right hand side of the holding slide that you're looking at at the moment. Otherwise, please mute your microphones until you are speaking if you're asking a question. Okay, so we've got 41 people with us at the moment. I'm hoping that more will join. We're expecting um, upwards of about 80, hopefully. Um, but I'm going to start introducing people, uh, introducing the speakers, otherwise um, we're going to run out of time. So our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Luke Munford who is Senior Lecturer in Health Economics at the University of Manchester and a researcher in the economic sustainability theme of the Applied Research Collaboration or the ARC. And Luke is also working across all the ARCs as part of the ARC National Health and Care Inequalities Consortium. Interesting fact about Luke. Well, there are loads I could tell you, but I can tell you that he is from Shildon in County Durham, which is one of the most deprived areas of the country and in fact classified by the government as a left behind area. I can also tell you he went to school with Scarlett Moffat. And if you've got a clue who Scarlett Moffat is, you're way ahead of, it, of me in that. Uh, he'll speak uh, in, a, in a few moments about regional inequalities during the year of COVID in the North. Our second speaker will be Professor Caroline Sanders. And Caroline is Professor of Medical Sociology in the Centre for Primary Care and Health Services Research at the University of Manchester. Caroline has a background in nursing and does qualitative research about patient and community experiences, especially in relation to long-term conditions, inequalities in access to care, digital health and patient safety. She leads the marginalised groups research theme in the NIHR Patient Safety Translational Research Centre here at the University of Manchester. And she also leads on public and community involvement and engagement for Manchester Academic Health Science Centre and for the ARC. Caroline has been instrumental in establishing and leading a One Greater Manchester joined up approach to public and community involvement and engagement. And, and that unites us all. Caroline was born and raised in Little Halton, Salford, which makes her particularly interested in local place-based inequalities. The secret I can reveal about Caroline is that she's a recent convert to the benefits of wild swimming, but only in a wetsuit. Caroline will speak about exploring inequalities and community experiences in the context of COVID-19 and the vaccination programme in Greater Manchester. But first, we are going to hear from Luke. So I am going to hand over the floor to him and he's going to share his screen. As I say, just put your questions in the chat um, as we go or save them up and ask them orally at the end. Thanks very much, Luke. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nikki. And thank you for the invitation to speak today about um, a couple of pieces of work that we've been doing over the last few years, really looking at regional inequalities in health and economic outcomes in England, particularly through um, a north-south lens. So the work I'll talk about here today um, comes from three reports that have been coordinated by the NHSA, the Northern Health Science Alliance, and they were really good umbrella organisations of universities, NHS organisations, and similar um, within the north of England. So the first report, um, Health for Wealth, was from 2018, where we really looked at the relationships between 
uh, regional health inequalities and wealth uh, economic inequalities. And one last year and one this year looking at COVID-19. So the one last year was the first six months. And then the one we um, released the other week looked at as much data as we possibly could. So before we go on to what happened during the pandemic, I think it's important to set the scene what we knew and was happening before COVID-19. So what was the state of the country in terms of health and wealth um, inequalities pre-COVID? So these um, maps here are um, the East Coast Main Line, the West Coast Main Line and the Great Western Railway Line. And each dot um, shows a station on these um, railway lines and dots that are coloured red have life expectancy at least six months um, less than the English average. Those in amber or orange have life expectancy around the English average and then the green dots have life expectancy at least six months above the English average. So just looking at this, you can see that the more north you go, the more likely the dots are to be red. So life expectancy in the north is typically lower than the English average. In the south, the dots are more likely to be green, indicating life expectancy above um, the English average. I mean, there are some notable exceptions. And I think that's important to stress that there are some areas of, of good health within the north, and there are some areas that have um, quite poor health within the south. But on average, the north does worse than the south and the rest of England. If we look at life expectancy over time, we can see that really uncommon for a developed country that these gaps in life expectancies, these inequalities are actually grown, particularly from the 2010s onwards, this gap in life expectancy of females has got wider. In a similar period since reunification, Germany, East and West Germany has completely eradicated their gap in life expectancy. Whereas the not uh, the Eng England went from having a very little gap to now a very pronounced gap. So there's something going on in England where these regional inequalities are really getting um, wider. We can look at lots of different health outcomes, and almost whichever health, whichever health outcome we look at um, on average is worse in the north than the rest of England. And again, I'm stressing on average because there are some areas in the north that do quite well and some areas in the south that do um, less well. But the big takeaway messages are that health tends to be worse and a lot worse in some areas than it is in the rest of the country. If we look at some economic outcomes, um, we can show that the North does worse in terms of economic prospects and outcomes as well. So on the left is job density. So just to interpret that, so the Northern powerhouse is this um, George Osborne idea of the North acting collectively to maximize its economic impact. But in this Northern Powerhouse area, for every 100 people, there are only 79 um, jobs available. In the Northeast, that's as low as 73. In Yorkshire and the Humber in the Northwest, they're early 80s. Compare that with London, where there's 102 jobs for every 100 people, you can see the regional imbalances. And again, the Southwest and the Southeast do much better than areas in the North. If people had a job in the north, their wages in 2019 were lower than they were in the rest of the country. So in the north, the average salary was about 23,200, 1,500 pound less than the rest of England, excluding London. And then when we include London, the gap gets bigger again. And we always try and take London out and compare the north to the rest of the country and with or without London for economic outcomes, because we know London is such um, an anomaly in terms of its economic performance. And again, this wage differential is true um, for males and females. So if we put all of this together, the um, measure of economic performance at a subnational level, so the local authority version of gross domestic product is called gross value added. And that essentially tells us the value of all economic goods and services produced within an area um, in a given year. So between 2010 and 2018, the GVA gross value added in the North grew by about 6.5% compared to 10% in the rest of the country or 9% in the rest of the country if we exclude London. So this gap was already quite big in 2010. It's got bigger and it's projected to get even further. In 2017-2018, um, the gap in this gross value added between the North and the rest of the country was about four pound per person per hour. And when that gets scaled up to a national level, that is a 44 billion pound difference in lost productivity because the North underperforms when compared to the rest of the country. 
So we know that health in the north is typically worse than health in the rest of the country. We know the economic performance in the north is typically um, below that of the economic performance in the rest of the country. So a natural question would be, are these two things related? Can we work out how much of this gap in um, productivity is directly attributable to worse health outcomes in the north? And we applied some statistical analysis to these data and found that about 30% of this gap in productivity is directly attributable to worse health um, in the north. So that is about £13.2 billion pound a year that is lost due to ill health um, in the north of England. We think this is a very conservative underestimate because these other factors here, the 60% part of this pie chart, include things like training, skills, education, which we know are positively associated with health. So if we can improve health, we'll also improve some of these other factors. So it's, much, it's likely to be a much bigger um, additional um, productivity we can add to the UK economy. But £13.2 billion pound per year is our conservative underestimate of the economic costs of ill health in the north. What could possibly be causing these widening divides? So without going too political, I think there's a big consensus that austerity disproportionately hit um, areas that could least afford it, so areas at high deprivation and poorer health were much more likely to experience bigger reductions in their local authority spending power. So what happened during COVID, given that health was worse, we expected there to be some reason inequalities, but I don't think we expected them to be as big as they were. So these maps here are just heat maps of the age sex standardized mortality rates between March 2020 and April 2021. And you can see there's clear hotspots of dark red, so the highest mortality rate in the northeast, east and south, eh, sorry, west and south Yorkshire, and the northwest Greater Manchester and Merseyside. And that's true for all cause mortality, COVID-19 mortality, and all uh, other cause mortality as well. So we just try and classify this regionally. So the English average mortality rate due to COVID-19 was about 194 um, deaths per 100,000 people. It was 1% higher in Yorkshire, 10% higher in the Northeast, and 21% higher in the Northwest. So all three Northern regions have higher than the English average levels of mortality due to COVID. If we look at smaller areas within the North, and particularly within the Northwest, we can see that the picture in Greater Manchester really is quite worrying. So the COVID-19 mortality rate within Greater Manchester was 38% higher than the English average. Merseyside was 28% higher, County Durham, and where I'm from was about 20% higher. Almost all areas within the North are higher than the national average levels of COVID-19 mortality. North Yorkshire and Cumbria are the two exceptions. We can do a similar um, region analysis looking at all cause mortality. So obviously COVID mortality is really important, but there was mortality from other causes as well. So the English average was about 1,083 deaths per 100,000 people, 6% higher in Yorkshire and Humber, 12% higher in the Northwest, and 13% higher in the Northeast. And again, it's not particularly good for Greater Manchester, where the all-cause mortality rate was 17% higher than average, County Durham 18% higher, and then Merseyside 20% higher. Even when we look within GM, because we are a little bit guilty of lumping the North as one entity, or even the Northwest, we know there's a lot of variation within the Northwest, and there's even a lot of variation within Greater Manchester. So if we look at the 10 boroughs of GM, only two, Stockport and Trafford, had mortality about the same level as the national average, so between sort of minus one and minus 5% of the national average. In Manchester, the borough of Manchester, the statistic is really quite staggering. So the mortality rate here was 60% higher than the national average for COVID, 40% higher for all causes, and 36% higher for um, other causes. Five of the 10 boroughs had COVID-19 mortality, COVID mortality rates at least 50% higher than the national average. So we really do need to try and investigate these inequalities on a, on a smaller scale level as well. So what I, put, uh, what I showed up to now was just simple um, age standardised mortality rates, but we know that the North is different. 
So what we want to do is want to see whether the exposure of living in the north led to worse COVID-19 outcomes. We know that the age profile and the ethnicity profile of people living in the north is different to the rest of the country. We also know that these two things affected COVID-19 outcomes. We know that people living in the north were more likely to have um, poorer pre-COVID health, and that would then obviously be associated with worse COVID-19 outcomes. We know that people living in the north were more likely to live in deprivation and be in, uh, in poverty than people in the rest of the country. And again, this factors, these factors are related to um, worse COVID-19 outcomes. So we run a series of um, regression models to try and quantify some of these effects. So model one is a simple association between living in the north and having worse outcomes. Models two and three introduce factors we know to be associated with um, worse COVID outcomes, so the age structure and the ethnicity structure. And then in model four, we introduce terms that we um, call as potentially preventable or modifiable. So IMD is a measure of um, deprivation. And the rate of people shielding is a proxy for the underlying health status of the population. And we can use many different measures of health and we get very, very similar results. But if we compare these betas between um, North, uh, model three and model four, this gives us an idea of how much of this northern excess mortality is potentially preventable. And that's what we do. So for COVID-19 um, mortality, the mortality rate in the north was 31.3 deaths per 100,000 more than the rest of the country, which reduces to about 15 more deaths per 100,000 when we account for deprivation and health. So the attenuation between these two um, numbers here is about 51%. So where we interpret this is that if deprivation and health in the North were similar to that in the rest of the country, 51% of this increased Northern mortality due to COVID or 15 deaths per 100,000 could potentially have been preventable. So this didn't have to happen. If health and more air deprivation was the same, we could have prevented a lot of this excess mortality. For all causes, the attenuation is even bigger. So 68% of the excess deaths within the North were potentially preventable, or 99 deaths per 100,000 people. So these are really big numbers that could potentially have been preventable if Leveling up was a thing and the health and economic prospects of people in the North were the same as the rest of the country. Some colleagues at Manchester and other places looked at excess mortality. So differences in mortality rates in 2020 compared to the same time periods in previous years. And again, Yorkshire and Humber, Northeast, Northwest had much higher rates of excess mortality than other regions of England. They also did the same for excess years of life lost. So that is how old people were when they die compared to a life table of when they were predicted to die. And again, the North lost more years of excess, uh, more years of life lost than other parts of the country. So we know that the mortality rates and the excess mortality rates were higher in the North. So we looked at what the hospital activity was like. So we know that hospitals have different numbers of beds in different parts of the country. So we looked at the percentage of all hospital beds that were occupied by COVID patients. For almost every time point during the pandemic, people, the hospitals in the North were more occupied with COVID patients uh, than in the rest of the country, with the exception of January um, 2021. So of the whole period, about 10% more hospital beds were occupied by COVID patients in the North than in the rest of England. Some colleagues at the IFS looked at what happened to hospital activity during the pandemic compared to the same period in earlier years. And they looked at elective admissions, emergency admissions and outpatient um, appointments. And again, the North did particularly badly. So there's bigger falls in all three types of um, hospital activity in the North than in other parts of the country. If we look at lockdowns, so we know that when the national lockdowns were relaxed, there was a um, uh, a localised lockdown policy. Tier one was the least restrictive um, lockdown scenario, tier two, tier three, and then tier four was the most restrictive um, period, uh, type of lockdown. And what is clear is that people living in the north, particularly the northwest and particularly Greater Manchester, spent much more time in tier four, the most restrictive um, lockdown category. And on average in the North, we calculate that as about a month and a half more that people had spent in the North 
in the most restrictive two years of lockdown than in the rest of England. So lockdowns are one factor that could influence mental health. There's obviously lots of other factors associated with the pandemic. And we use data here from a nationally representative survey that collects information on people's mental health. So on the left is just some trends over time, where here higher scores relate to better mental health. And we see that the rest of the country typically always has higher rates of mental health than, than the North. And particularly when there's more localised lockdown, these gaps between, uh, begin to grow again. Between 2018 and 2019, uh, sorry, between 2018, 19 and 2020, there's a 10 percentage point increase in the prevalence of minor psychiatric disorders, such as anxiety and depression in the North, which was much bigger than in the rest of the country. So it was already worse here and it got um, more worse quicker. Unemployment rates were always higher in the North than they were in the rest of the country. So before the pandemic, they were worse. And during the pandemic, this got, again, much worse, much quicker. Interestingly, there was no real difference between furlough uptakes in um, the North and the rest of the country. But the sort of counter argument is that people in the North are more likely to lose the jobs so are less likely to be placed on furlough schemes. Between 2019 and 2020, there was a, a decrease in um, wages in the North. I mean, it was quite a small decrease, but any decrease is really unprecedented between consecutive years, whereas the rest of the country was roughly the same, if not a slight increase. We consider a lot more um, outcomes and the links to the reports are on the slides. I'm happy to, to share the slides with people and there's lots of other um, outcomes we consider, but all of these outcomes were worse in the North than the rest of the country. The one positive to come out of, of the report was we found that the uptake of vaccinations was higher in the North. So this could have been much, much worse if, if that wasn't the case. There's a series of recommendations in the report that can essentially boil down to, we need to put health front and center of any leveling up agenda, any building back agenda, health has to take a main leading um, role in that. And just to shamelessly plug another piece of work, so we were lucky enough to find out we've been um, funded to look at the role the NHS can play as an anchor institution. So anchor institutions are big employers that can make a real difference to people's employment prospects and wages. Particularly, they can reduce inequalities by recruiting staff from deprived areas with certain characteristics to try and reduce socioeconomic inequalities and therefore um, health inequalities too. So thank you very much. Um, so the links to the reports that are, are all here are all available online. I'm more than happy to chat to anyone um, in more detail later. So thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. That was excellent. And 19 minutes, a minute to spare. Oh, well um, so without further ado, I am going to um, hand over to Caroline to give her presentation. But let me remind you, please put questions in the chat as and when they occur to you uh, or ask them at the end. But it'd be great to have some discussion. There's nothing worse as a speaker than nobody asking a question at the end. So bear that in mind. Over to you, Caroline. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can you, oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Nikki. Um, sorry, I just need to, oops. If you're like oh, sorry. The community, there has been suspicion. Sorry about this, I'm not sure. And, and, and that is there. more historic than current. Sorry about that. Can you see my screen? Not at the moment. Have another go. Um, I don't know what's happened. Do you want me to? Have a can, go. You, oh, okay. can you see it? See it now. We just, you just need to back up one slide, I think. Okay. Thank you. And then go on presentation. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Don't worry, it's fine. 
Thank you for your patience. Great. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. So um, I'm delighted to have been invited to talk to you about this work on behalf of a, a large team of people who I'm going to um, introduce in a moment on the next slide. Um, I think it complements the big picture that Luke has, has, has presented in that fantastic presentation, really important work done by Luke and, and the team. And in this presentation, I'll focus down on this topic of inequalities in community experiences in the context of COVID-19 and the vaccination programme in Greater Manchester. So um, there are multiple components of, of this work, which is, is, is hosted within the Applied Research Collaboration in Greater Manchester. Um, first of all, the public involvement work has been absolutely key, and that has been dependent on inputs of the public and community involvement and engagement panel and a wider community forum, as well as uh, a project specific community advisory group. And for this, we're really grateful to Nazreen Akhtar, uh, Basma Issa, Charles Kwaku Adoy and Nick Filer for their crucial input for this project and the ARC um, Public and Community Involvement and Engagement Team, referred to as the PCIE team, Anila McAvoy, Nikki Timmis, Joanna um, Ferguson and Sue Wood. So the research falls within two related pieces of work. First, a piece of research conducted by analysing data within the Greater Manchester Care Record to compare rates of uptake across multiple socio-demographic groups for COVID vaccination compared to flu vaccination. Ruth Watkinson is the principal investigator for that work and pictured there. And a second piece of, of qualitative research investigating views and experiences of COVID and the vaccination programme amongst community groups and key stakeholders. And Steph uh, Gillibrand is leading on that piece of work with some oversight and support from me for the PCIE work and the qualitative work. And ideally, Ruth and Stephanie would be talking today, but unfortunately, due to timing of annual leave, they're unable to speak themselves today. And it's, it's down to me to talk about some of our work so far in the, in the presentation. And I'll be focusing on the public and community involvement engagement work and the qualitative research plans and progress so far. Again, ideally, I would be sharing this spot with members of our advisory group, but as um, we, we've... Um, managed to ask members of our advisory group who've, who've offered written reflections and are sharing some reflections via a couple of film clips due to um, the, the short um, time between being asked to do this presentation and doing it. Um, so moving forward, um, so as the work is, is currently ongoing, I'm not presenting final findings, and I hope that Stephanie will do that in a subsequent pro presentation. Instead, what I want to do in the presentation is share some of the journey so far, a journey that started with initial ideas and plans that were subsequently shaped by um, PCIE work and input from key stakeholders involved in planning and delivering the vaccination programme in Greater Manchester. In the presentation, I'll, I'll start by giving some background in terms of initial plans for research on inequalities in the vaccine programme, and then talk about how involvement and engagement work shaped the uh, quant quantitative research as an illustration of, and, and an illustration of, of the findings. Um, the involvement work and the engagement work to shape the plans for the qualitative research and a summary of progress so far. And then finally, just some, some comments on next steps and final points for discussion. So the initial thinking for this project was initiated by Ruth Watkinson with input from um, Professor Matt Sutton and a wider team focused um, on a project um, focused on population health research using available health data. They were reflecting on the background evidence in inequalities in relation to COVID and the plans for the, for the vaccination programme prior to rollout. And there were a number of key issues to consider. The policy plans for rolling out the programme were based on prioritisation of older age groups and people considered to be clinically vulnerable. And there were concerns about variations in uptake for different social groups. And in the initial um, stages of the vaccination rollout, there was rapidly emerging data highlighting lower uptake for most ethnic groups, despite increased risks of COVID-19 and higher mortality. 
And this was viewed as an opportunity to use the Greater Manchester Care Record to investigate inequalities in vaccination. And I'll now just say a little bit to explain the GM Care Record for those who might be unfamiliar with that. So as this slide explains, the GM Care Record pulls patient information for Greater Manchester citizens from health and care organisations, including primary care and secondary care service providers. And these records were previously held within different areas. And what the record does is collate patient information from across Greater Manchester into one place, making it easily accessible from across geographies and multiple organisations delivering services. It allows professionals in health or social care easy access to patient information to support patient care and treatment and has been viewed as crucial during the pandemic in the fight against COVID. Um, and it also provides a mechanism by which citizens de-identified health and care data related to COVID-19 can be used for research. And this has been closely overseen by key governance groups set to monitor how this data is being used. The project to establish the Greater Manchester Care Record has been overseen by Health Innovation Manchester and the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership on behalf of Greater Manchester's devolved health and social care partners. Um, and one of the main benefits of these arrangements for data sharing has been um, to enable um, analysis of anonymised data from this record to enable better understanding of inequalities and how to address them. Alongside the initial thinking from the research team on what research might be needed and possible to do, there was already extensive um, uh, involvement and engagement work underway within our um, ARC collab um, applied research collaboration with public contributors and community partners focused on um, key concerns for communities in relation to health and wellbeing um, experiences during the pandemic. And this slide shows the two main groups set up to work in partnership with um, ArcGM researchers and teams at Health Innovation Manchester. These groups have worked together on many different projects during the pandemic, but they've importantly enabled extensive connections with wider networks. And mem many members were directly involved in community action to tackle COVID and inequalities experienced across many local communities. And this provided a strong basis for shared learning um, and was the basis of a briefing paper um, on experiences of, of COVID during the pandemic. And that's available from the ARC GM website as well. Um, plus, the, lots of members of the forum were producing multiple reports of their own detailed work, including um, examples of reports from voluntary organisations working with people from ethnic communities, Groundswell, which was a charity working with people experiencing homelessness, and others directly helping people facing poverty, mental health, support for young people, digital inclusion and the arts and creative methods to support people facing social isolation. And in some of these discussions about experiences during COVID, the topic of vaccination, diverse views and perspectives were discussed. Um, and and, and um, this was, we then took um, further discussions to this specific panel and forum in relation to the research being planned um, by um, Ruth and the wider team for the quantitative work to analyze um, inequalities in the GM uh, care record. Um, and we also held um, uh, specifically, um, uh, we, we also set up a specific um, community advisory group for the research and held multiple meetings with key stakeholders, including those um, delivering the, the vaccination uh, program and, and key strategic leads. So this slide just shows um, attempt to show some of the key issues raised during the discussions and common themes and also distinct experience. So mistrust in relation to government and health services amongst ethnic communities was repeatedly mentioned. Many referred to previous experiences with racism, the importance of history within local neighbourhoods and com communities. And there was a sense that trust was being undermined and inequalities deepened by some of the discourse and actions in response to COVID and COVID regulations. And there was a discussion about community cultural barriers to uptake, including language around uptake, negative connotations and alternative uh, meanings, creating further barriers and discussions about beliefs and knowledge of COVID and health risks. And there, were, there was a view that small minority of communities, um, sm uh, smaller minorities and communities were um, neglected and ignored. 
um, as well, and a view that people were not giving voice to anti-vax sentiments in general. Um, there was a lot of resistance in, and frustration in many cases in response to some of the language and response that dismissed concerns about COVID vaccination programme um, and reflecting it as an, a, a part of an anti-vaccination movement. Um, this related to other discussions uh, about misinformation around messaging and um, a key point was, was a concern about the lack of open and honest dialogue where people um, have a space to voice and um, have dialogue about the issues raised. Um, and there were often uncertainty and complex views about vaccination and struggles within individual decisions. And people also talked about personal barriers. Uh, mentioning impacts of factors such as peer, um, the influence of peers, family and caring context, and personal health context. And physical and other barriers um, to uptake in the vaccine um, made reference to transport, employment, shift work, etc. Um, so I'm just going to let one of our advisory members um, uh, from, from our advisory group uh, talk. This is Charles um, Kwaku Adoy from the Caribbean and African Health Network, who's part of our advisory group talking about the views of Caribbean and African health uh, communities, and particularly reflecting on the concerns about mistrust and racism. And um, Charles also talked about some of the importance of wider inequalities that had come to the fore um, during the pandemic. So, in a large part of the community, there has been suspicion, and, and that is more historic than current, but also you know, the biggest barrier we found is, has been lack of trust for local and central government. And, and that has meant that although there has been lots of investment into public health messaging and, you know, targeted engagement, the, the community hasn't been very receptive, you know, to the messages. And, you know, that, that's been pretty much that. But, but also what we know are some of the historic you know uh, institutional racism and and the lack of engagement from our community so for example people were asking questions around you know whether there were black people as part of the clinical trials you know and if there weren't many then how do we know the vaccine is effective so and and charles also went on to talk about um, you know the, the need to consider a more holistic approach and consider wider inequalities and the importance of the Black Lives Matters movement that has placed race back on, on the agenda um, and encourage, encourage people to be brave in, in engaging with some of those sensitive issues. Thank you very much. Oh, so, and, and next, this is um, one of our advisory group members, Basma Issa, um, who talked about many aspects of experiences of working um, within the Syrian community during the pandemic and also summarised some, some key points here. So Basma also talks about wider experiences of particular struggles in her work amongst Syrian refugees and some of what they did to support each other during the pandemic and the problems with mental and, health, uh, mental and physical health problems, some of the varied beliefs and sources of information and knowledge about the vaccine. She said there were many people who had a lot of suspicion about the vaccine and its potential side effects, such as causing um, fertility problems and also as an agent of government control, um, and that people struggled to get information. And she was part of a, a group translating information to help other Syrian women via a WhatsApp group. So based on these initial discussions, there was a shift in the plans for the research focused specifically on inequalities in uptake rather than earlier ideas about inequalities in eligibility. And the views about inequalities in uptake seemed very specific to the context of COVID. Um, and this made the research team think about how uptake for COVID vaccine compared to other routine vaccinations um, and led to a focus on um, comparing the COVID vaccine uptake with flu vaccination. And I'm just going to say a little bit, just, just um, very brief insight into some of the findings from that um, research. Um, so this, this is just one illustration, and it might seem complicated for some people who are not experts, and I'm just going to explain what it shows, um, and also acknowledging that I'm not an expert in this analysis either. So some of you might have questions about this work, and I know Ruth is also back from holiday and able to join the presentation, so hopefully she can address any questions that people have on this analysis. So the team analysed the GM care record to analyse um, inequalities in COVID vaccination across different age groups um, and consider multiple factors, including um, 
comparison of richer and poorer neighbourhoods and uptake between ethnic groups. This slide shows inequalities between ethnic groups based on the analysis. In this case, each group is compared to the white British group. So the white British group is shown in green. Anywhere that has higher vaccine uptake is shown in yellow. And turquoise and blue, the darker blue, indicate, um, indicates lower uptake. The darkest blue, purple, you can see um, on the scale on the right is, uh, shows the greatest inequality. And you can see that um, this compares COVID on the left with the flu season vaccination 2019 to 20 on the right. Um, so you can see, and, and the inequalities here, shown here, are far wider than those associated with income deprivation. Overall, the widest gaps between the white British group and the black African, black Caribbean and other black background and Arab groups. Um, the figure shows inequalities are wider for COVID uh, vaccination compared to flu vaccination, as you can see looking at that colour scale. Um, and really wide inequalities for those um, recorded as white, um, as white British, um, uh, uh, between those recorded as white British and those with no ethnicity data recorded. Okay, so the findings were discussed also by our advisory group and key stakeholders, and I've included a comment from one of our advisory group members who reflected on the value of this kind of analysis. And we also worked with our advisory group members to develop further plans for qualitative research which I'll just cover briefly. So these were the, um, the aims of, of the qualitative group that, that we developed um, with a view to being able to provide some more in-depth insights um, to explore the inequalities shown in the quantitative analysis. So these focus on views and experiences of communities that will provide useful findings for those involved in planning vaccination and the COVID response um, that is learning from communities themselves. So these are our methods and, and progress just summarized on this slide. Um, so, so we're taking a participatory group uh, approach, doing focus groups and interviews co-facilitated by our community partners within some of their communities and networks and with some engagement of, of non-English speaking communities as well. And we're also interviewing community leaders and healthcare staff and decision makers. Um, and so far we've done three focus groups, two within South Asian communities, one with participants who have long-term conditions and, and 10 interviews so far with members of the public, um, people in the NHS and involved in the vaccine programme and community leaders. So next, I've just got another member of our advisory group who's going to, um, who has some reflections on the on our approach with Hopefully this work. We can build from this research, identify where the challenges are, where our weaknesses are, and what's working. As the, the role of a public uh, contributor, I believe I have built relationships with a very diverse community, um, and we can now amplify the voices of those who are often left unheard, was able to support my community in terms of translation of languages. Um, so we are breaking boundaries in research by working together collaboratively. Hopefully we can... So that's um, great to hear from, from Nazreen and some further reflections that she gave in relation to the focus group she's um, been co-facilitating. Right, so I'm going to spend the last um, minute or two talking about next steps and um, just some final conclusions. So for our next steps, um, we're going to do further focus groups and interviews. We'll be doing ongoing analysis of that qualitative research and we'll have a focus on um, NHS staff and vaccine vaccination programme leads and teams. Um, we want to gather insights from the, some of the specific work in local communities that's already underway, working with community leaders and champions, um, engagement and, and dialogue with local people. We know that some of the areas that have sounding boards, um, information and dialogue, including um, non-English speakers and also uh, various um, interventions to um, as part of the vaccine programme, mobile units, et cetera, and valued community spaces. So just to conclude and um, some, some points for further discussion, um, research using the GM care record provides new evidence um, describing substantial inequalities in uptake for ethnic groups that were greater than in the case of flu vaccination uptake. 
and our embedded um, public and community involvement and engagement, our participatory research approach facilitates understanding experiences across common themes, including mistrust, experiences of racism, as well as differences for distinct communities, and, more, and enables more in-depth insi insights on multiple dimensions of inequality, including gender, age, and deprivation. So I guess we have further questions. What, what do we need to do? Um, what more needs to be done in relation to inequalities and, and especially what can we learn from our local communities and, and taking that holistic approach? And I think the work that Luke has presented also um, indicates a real need for that. And what, what further research is needed to develop evidence to inform policy and practice what, uh, to find out what interventions work in what context? Um, including new interventions such as the vaccine hubs. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. That was excellent. If you could just um, stop sharing, that would be great. Um, I'm not, oh, there we are. Yeah, you've done it. That is brilliant. So we've got about um, 13 minutes left for discussion and questions, which is fab. Um, a couple of questions came in before uh, the seminar. Um, so bear in mind these posed before um, the questioners heard what you had to say. Uh, but the first question asks whether we know much about the infections and outcomes uh, of COVID-19 uh, in the child population in the north. I'm happy to take that um, and that leads really nicely on to another report that um, has been done through the NHSA and the N8 and Policy in Manchester looking very much at the impact on children of um, the pandemic so in terms of the health effects, their education effects, their um, whole experiences, their interactions of friend, their learning and again looking at this through a uh, regional inequalities point of view so there's no real hard finds out there yet because the report is still being finalised, but the preliminary findings are really, really stark and I think it's a really important um, piece of work and there needs to be investment in children um, in, in all the country, but particularly in the north and particularly in deprived areas. Thanks, Luke. And I think it's worth thinking about as well, um, that we can't answer that, what the implications of long COVID are for both children and adults and you showed very well in your presentation that the uh, the big gap between the uh, larger numbers of people affected by covid in the north than um than elsewhere and that's going to just exacerbate the long covid impact of all that is going to exacerbate those inequalities going forward as well and children are also affected by that aren't they so we can only imagine i suppose um what's going to happen in the future um the second um question um which I think has been broadly addressed, but both of you might want to come back um, at it. As, as posed, the question is how has race, uh, how has race been a factor in health inequalities during this pandemic? Um, and uh, we've seen a lot about race here. Is there, uh, are there any sort of nuggets you just want to emphasize? Um, firstly, Caroline, and then I'll come back to Luke. Yes, thanks, Nikki. Well, as, as you can see um, from the presentation that I gave, this is certainly, uh, you know, uh, a real priority topic amongst the communities that we've been um, working with. And, and you can, and, and I guess, you know, some of what I highlighted was gave some glimpses into inequalities from, certainly from that, the evidence um, from the work completed by Ruth. And I think, um, you know, that just emphasizes, you know, how wide those inequalities are. And I guess some of the limitations of previous research that has reported on very broad categories of, of, of race, ethnicity, and that there needs to be further work that is able to drill down and look at um, major inequalities within um, very distinct ethnic communities. And I think that requires mixed methods research as well to understand um, the experiences of people, as well as the patterning of those inequalities in order to ensure that there are appropriate responses. Great, thank you. Luke, is there anything you want to add about race? Just that we know um, nationally that the, there were very stark differences in the mortality rates and the infection rates between um, different ethnicities and races. 
Um, and there are lots of potential socioeconomic reasons behind that. And there's a lot of really great work going on at Manchester through people like James Nazaru. And we're really drilling down into this and trying to get a more complete understanding of what happened and why and what we can possibly do about this. Yeah, because it's only by getting this really nuanced understanding can we mount the right response, yeah. the right interventions. That's right, isn't it? It's not just about describing. The only point in doing that is if we can try and do something about it. I've got a question from David Fishwick from, for you, Luke. And that's quite a long question. He really enjoyed your talk. How much were you able in the models also to consider specific individual health conditions, access to healthcare and its quality, uh, areas where messages might not have been fully appreciated or not engaging the target populations? Were there sub-regional differences or pockets of lower uptake that might have explained poor outcomes in certain areas? I don't think you can answer all of that because that's lots of stuff, but if you can just pick one or two bits you want to address, that'd be great. Yeah, so the specific health conditions is really interesting. So our data was mainly at an area level, so we can't get the whether or not a certain person has a health condition, but we can get the average levels of prevalence in certain areas. And we experimented with lots of different um, definitions of health, looking at pre-COVID um, prevalences of respiratory conditions, um, a lot of other conditions. And our results were incredibly robust because a lot of these prevalences are very, what we would say is collinear. So areas that have high prevalence of certain health conditions have high prevalence of almost all health conditions. But I think it would be really good to get the individual level data and look at an individual level of what health conditions predicted worse um, COVID outcomes, but at the moment we just don't have access to that um, data. But the yeah. point on um, target interventions and what was ha happening in different localities is really, really interesting. And I was chatting to uh, Marty Van Tongren this morning, I think is on the call, and they've got a project looking at exactly that. And they're talking to directors of public health about what they did in certain areas and why the sort of differences between areas and if we can learn from that. And if certain areas are different things in different ways. Um, and then the, the second part of the question, I think, is exactly what Caroline chatted yeah. about, about the targeted yeah. uh, vaccines and why people maybe aren't so keen to have vaccines, etc. Yeah. Yeah, that triangulates really well with, with Caroline's uh, presentation, doesn't it? I've got um, a question from Karim Webb to you, Luke. Uh, Karim works for the Northern Care Alliance in data science and they're always looking for new data sources and APIs, no idea what that means, uh, to plug into help us colour our narrative when analysing health inequality. Any suggestions beyond our usual hospital level data? So the main data sources we used were the Office of National Statistics data on mortality and um, Public Health England um, is unfortunately no more, but it, it, they, they do have a brilliant website called Fingertips, which allow you to get very good, quite small area levels of measures of health and prevalence of health conditions and all sorts of, of different measures. But maybe if you send me an email, I'll be very happy to describe lots of the data that we've used in various different reports, because there is an abundance out there, but some of it is hidden away. That's great, thank you. Um, and I think this is really one for Caroline. And, and I think if we can unpack this a bit more as well, coming back to the question about that Luke was David Fishwick's question about really understanding what's happening with vaccinations, but you can maybe drill that down into that bit more. Um, so a question from Paul Hine: is there any indication that young people are less likely to take the vaccine? So that's a really good question from, from Paul. Um, and I think this, this is posing a question that was also posed by the, the, the leaders of the vaccine vaccination programme in Greater Manchester Tours and um, prompted us to do a little bit more engagement work around this um, with, with young people. And of course, actually, Paul was a really helpful partner in, in, to, in relation to his organisation made by Mortals. Um, that is a, a, a theatre-based charity as well and enabled us to do some creative engagement with young people. Um, and I didn't have time to, to cover that in addition to the other things in the presentation, but you know, we certainly got some really interesting insights from that engagement um, work with young people, which I think has you know, obviously became a more critical issue as, as time went on through the rollout of the vaccination programme because they weren't part of the early 
rollout, but then as as, as attention was turning to, towards that, there was there were there were lots of concerns about whether or not people would uh, younger people would take up the vaccine, and I think some of the key issues that that came up in discussion groups um, that that were conducted as part of that work and a community based survey that uh, this work was was led by. Um, uh, Steph Gillibrand, you know, that the, there was a lot of discussion about fear around vaccine safety um, and, and fear and suspicion that vaccines would be made mandatory, um, neg- uh, you know, reflections on negative stories in the media and um, the importance of, of, of social encouragement and, and reassurance and concerns about long term side effects were particular particularly came up as well so those are just some of the i guess i guess some qualitative insights that i think we'll learn more about as 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 those as that work um goes forward and some more engagement work on that um so so yeah that's that's just just some reflection from that public and community um work and in terms of drilling down, I think that's the um, related to some of the issues I, I, I tried to convey a little bit in that presentation that people certainly who, who we were talking to as part of that um, wider engagement and qualitative research were concerned about some of these issues of, that were specifically um, contextual in terms of long term conditions and other things as well. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I mean, just drawing things to a close now, because we're going to be closing in a second. You raised on one of your uh, last slides, um, you know, what might the next steps be? How might we um, do work going forwards on this? And you talked about um, vaccination hubs as a possible intervention uh, that might, you know, because we know that vaccines are highly effective. And um, if we can reduce inequalities to access vaccines we reduce some important inequalities in health and um, so we need to look at new and exciting ways of delivering vaccines that are maybe less traditional and and that, uh, uh, in shaping those I think we need to work much more closely with local communities to understand the meaning of vaccines to them what will enable them to be able to access them uh, you know you know what their understandings and beliefs are about vaccines so um, and base services around those. So um, just to say that we are hoping to get some more um, resource into Greater Manchester um, to evaluate some of the vaccination hub models going forwards, because we think that they might be an interesting way of looking at vaccine delivery beyond COVID um, for other kinds of vaccines. So, um, you know, if we can, because the great thing about vaccination is the, the data about who's vaccinated is captured really, really well. The record keeping is really good. Uh, and we've, we've seen the power of working at grassroots level to understand, you know, what's driving vaccination behavior. So if we can bring those two together and do things that are gonna be meaningful for people on the ground, we might be able to, to reduce some of those gaps uh, and measure the effect of what we do fairly readily, which is quite important. So I've just got a very, very final question from Hannah Bai for Caroline, uh, which is how can we get updates on your follow up studies, um, for example, possible interventions that could be used to promote vaccination? How can uh, Caroline and Lucas, I, I think, how can we keep in touch with the amazing work that you're doing so that we you know, can respond to it, put it into action? Well, I, I'd just like to say thank you for that question. That's I'm delighted to hear people are interested in in this work. And I would say just to to um, if if people look at our website for um, the applied research collaboration is 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 one way of getting um, lots of outputs related to multiple components of work because we we're often updating there. And some of our engagement reports that I referred to are also downloadable from there. And of course, as, as publications are forthcoming when we're producing outputs, people can also tap into those from that website. There's also some, I'd just like to give a quick plug to a, um, an, a week of, an, of a, a long community festival of events from the 18th of October. And the information about that is also on the website. And some of the work that we've discussed here will also be presented at different um, events during that, that week. And if people would like to sign up and join that, be part of that dialogue and conversation, we'd really welcome that. Wonderful. Anything you want to add to that, Luke? No, that was perfect. Thanks, Caroline.
Okay. In which case, I'd, I'd just like to thank you, well, both our speakers, who I think were absolutely tremendous, and all of you for your participation, for your attendance, but more than that, for your great uh, questions. Um, please come to as many of our seminars as you can. Um, I can't say they're all as brilliant as this, but um, they're all pretty good, so it would never be a waste of time, so do sign up. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody.